not every day President Obama makes an apology. On behalf of the United States government, I offer our deepest apologies to the families. Yesterday, he revealed a U.S. airstrike killed two aid workers who'd been held hostage by Al-Qaeda. Investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill has called Obama's use of drones murder. There's this sort of secret air war that is seen but never confirmed publicly by any named officials. He wrote the book Blackwater, the rise of the world's most powerful mercenary army. I got a strange phone call. And produced dirty wars that alleges the U.S. operates hit squads around the globe. There are hundreds of covert operations. It was nominated for an Oscar. Now, Scahill's a founding editor of the online news site, The Intercept, which regularly makes international headlines with its investigations of secret military operations. And he says Canada isn't as far removed as we might think. There will, however, be no ground combat mission, which is explicitly ruled out in the resolution. Scahill says the new form of global warfare allows for more secrecy and less accountability, themes that have resonated in Canada lately. For example, there are still conflicting reports about Special Operations Soldier Andrew Duaron, who was killed in that friendly fire incident. Uh, Sergeant Duaron and his colleagues did not expect to come under fire. I asked Jeremy Scahill about that and more in an exclusive television interview in Toronto. President Obama is now apologizing for a counterterrorism strike that killed two aid workers, an American and an, Itali and an Italian. What, what did you think when you heard that apology? To me, what's interesting about this um, is that there have been eight Americans killed in drone strikes since 9-11, and only one of them, uh, we're told, was, in, was the intended target of the strike. So if, if, you, if you look at that math, uh, only one out of eight Americans killed was uh, targeted. Uh, for assassination in a drone strike. The other were, were so-called mistakes. There have been 3,000 plus people killed in drone strikes. What does that mean the error ratio is in, in those cases? Are you arguing that it's worse than it used to be before drones were involved? It sanitizes war. It, it makes it feel more like a video game. Uh, in fact, they're recruiting video game players to try to train them as, as drone pilots. So in that sense, drones raise certain issues. They make it easier to go to war and justify it by saying, oh, our people aren't going to be killed. But the real scandal here is an attempt to say, uh, we don't recognize borders anymore when it comes to our national security. If we want to bomb someone in Yemen, even though we haven't declared war against Yemen, even if they're an American citizen, we have the right to do it. We don't even have to try to get an indictment against them. Uh, I would say that that's, that's a shift in policy. Is there any link to Canada in, in that kind of drone attack? Canada is a key member of what's called the Five Eyes Coalition which is uh, a, an intelligence sharing partnership that the United States and, and some of its closest allies have. Canada is feeding consistently information into a massive database that is then used by American counterterrorism planners to develop target lists. Um, Canada is actively pouring information into this base that could be used to conduct lethal operations around the world. Uh, so Canada is not just a passive player in this. Canada is actively feeding intelligence into a behemoth that at the end of the day shoots out names of people that should be killed or captured by the CIA or U.S. Special Operations Forces. There was just a debate in this country um, after two Canadians were killed by people with alleged links to, to terror, uh, a new bill that will give CSIS, Canadian spies, mm -hmm. more, more powers to come up with more information, target more people, but there's not more oversight. Right. I mean, the, 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 the greatest beneficiaries of so-called lone wolf terrorism um, have been intelligence agencies that are hell-bent on uh, power grabbing and minimizing our privacy supposedly in the name of security. Now, it's, it's not that there is not a risk in our societies of these so-called lone wolf actors that are being inspired by things they've seen on the internet or the beheading videos that ISIS has put out. Um, that threat is real, but it's relatively minor compared to other threats we're facing in our society. I think we've overreacted in our society. I think Canada is overreacting. I think the US has systematically overreacted to the threat of terrorism. And I think we'll look back at some point and say, uh, it was a bad idea to allow these intelligence agencies to operate with limited to no real oversight or meaningful oversight and to give up some of our basic liberties and, and our privacy.
What is Canada's reputation internationally on, on security and terror issues? Well, if you talk to people within the U.S. intelligence community and the U.S. military, uh, Canadian special forces have played a key role, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, in the kill capture campaign uh, that the U.S. was waging. Um, Canadian special forces have an excellent reputation with some of the more unsavory dark ops forces in the United States. So I, th I think there is a... What do you a, mean? A, well, Canada, Australia, and Britain, all, and to a lesser extent Germany, have all provided high-end special ops forces to work in hybrid task forces with elite paramilitary units uh, of the United States. And, As in Iraq, and, 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 Well, in Iraq, but also in Afghanistan. I mean, my, my understanding from talking to people in that community in the U.S. is that Canadian special forces are very well respected among the black ops people in the United States, meaning that there's probably uh, a lot of uh, activity that Canadian special forces are involved with that never make the papers here. We know now that there are special, Canadian special forces officers being trained by, it's not called Blackwater anymore, mm -hmm. you wrote the book Academy, about Blackwater, yeah. The, the yeah, Academy now in North Carolina. Is there anything wrong with that? You know, in the United States, um, our Supreme Court has ruled that corporations have uh, personhood that they're, they have the same rights as people. Uh, this company should have been given the death penalty a long time ago. I mean, I'm against the death penalty for human beings, uh, but I am totally in support of the death penalty for corporations that are involved with mass murder, as, as Blackwater was. And uh, you know, I think the fact that that company has been allowed uh, to continue operating, even uh, though the public record shows that they've been responsible for widespread deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan, that they've defrauded the U.S. government, uh, that they have violated weapons regulations in the United States, that they've engaged in bribery. I mean, what's that company doing training Canada's forces? Well, I mean, apparently they are able to teach skills in a way that is not available elsewhere. I mean, do, can, do Defensive Canadian, driving and targeting. <laughs> well, do Canadian forces want the skill to gun down 16 innocent Iraqis in a square in Baghdad? I mean, this, well, I'm sure that's not what they're going for. Well, I mean, this is, but, but, but I, would, I would take issue with that because if you review the record of this company, personnel, the tone that its leadership set from the very beginning, they dehumanized Muslims, particularly Iraqis. They encouraged an atmosphere where uh, their operators believed that they were hunting people. Uh, they were keeping scorecards on Iraqis that they were killing and saying that it was payback for 9-11. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. They set a tone uh, at that company that said that Muslim life is worth less than uh, white Western lives. So I, I, I think it's a bad idea for Canada to engage with this particular uh, company given its track record. I don't think the company should be allowed to exist anymore. I think it should have been, should have been shut down. A special forces officer, Andrew Duaron, was killed um, in early March. Uh, we're not clear exactly on what happened. It was friendly fire. It was a mistake. But whose fault was it? The Peshmerga mm -hmm. or, or Canadian soldier? We still don't know. We've been promised an investigation. Journalists are now sort of banned from speaking to either side. It's, you know, it, in the old days there would be scandal and investigation. And, but, but now it's just we can't seem to get information at all. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the, the, the new reality. I mean, I, I think that some of, uh, you know, I, I speak from an American context, I mean, some of Barack Obama's policies on, on whistleblowing and, and on access for journalists to sort of secretive things would make Richard Nixon blush. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't necessarily know the Canadian reality, but I would imagine there are similar uh, actions at play toward journalists and the It's state. not getting easier it's, to get it's information. Not getting easier. <laughs> right, but in, you know, in this specific case, you know, I mean, the Canadians are supposed to be there in a in what they call an advise and assist capacity, where they're technically trying to. Yeah, uh, what does that mean? Because at first we thought <laughs> it wasn't at the front line. Turns out it is at or near the front line. Right. I mean, there there was there's this great line from uh, the 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 epic uh, American folk singer Phil Oakes about the Vietnam War, and he said the boy that was killed in the swamp didn't know he was killed by advisors. Uh, <laughs> meaning that the Americans were, they, well, we're just here as advisors, we're not combatants. And eventually, of course, it became a, a full-blown war. So Canada, the United States, Britain, other countries are in a very dangerous game right now in the Middle East because they're trying to kind of have it both ways. They want their forces on the ground because they want to ensure that they defeat ISIS, that they stop this spread, that they can figure out a way to stabilize the Iraqi government and deal with the complexities of Syria. But they don't want to invade. They'll use air power. But, they, but, but that's not enough. It's basically a way of outsourcing a ground war. In Canada, the government is very careful to always refer to what's happening in, in, to our role in uh, Iraq and in Syria as a mission. They never call it a war. Yeah. Is this a war? We, well, no, it's not a, a war in the traditional sense that we would think of World War II as a war where you have a uniformed army of one country uh, battling the uniformed military of, a, of another country. 
um, it's asymmetric war. And, uh, and, and you know, generally it's terrorists who were interested in waging it. In, in other words, they're not uniformed, they're attacking targets that are more powerful than them, but they're using spectacular events like the 9-11 uh, attacks uh, against the United States. The beheading or the, videos. Or the beheading videos or the Mumbai attacks to try to give the perception that they're more powerful than they are. That, that the symbolism of burning a Jordanian pilot alive in a, in a cage or chopping off the heads of, of journalists. Um, that's intended to sow fear in the hearts and minds of the Western public. And, and, and so what, what the United States and, and Canada and other countries are, are doing is they, they don't want to recognize these people as legitimate combatants that would have rights under the Geneva Conventions. So if you start to say it's a war, uh, then you have to treat your enemy in a specific way. So, you know, with Canada and the United States, they all play a game. You know, we, we, Canada calls it a mission. Barack Obama calls it a global contingency operation. That's the new term. But do you ignore it? No, but, but you have to understand the history of it. Um, ISIS is not just some uh, people that read the Quran and decided that they want to, you know, chop heads off. The people at the core of ISIS's military operations were people that in the 1980s were being trained and supported by the United States government. The weapons that ISIS currently has that allows them to blaze across territory and take land were weapons that the United States left behind to an Iraqi military that was not ready to accept them. So if we want to just reduce it down to these are radical jihadists and Islam is, you know, is this horrible religion and it makes people chop off heads, then you're missing the entire point of this story. This is blowback. We, we are paying for uh, our own support of Saddam Hussein, uh, for leaving so much military hardware for, behind, and for overthrowing the Iraqi government without any clear plan for how to stabilize that country. But Canadians are afraid. Two, two Canadians were killed, a lot of young people are leaving, families are like, please help. It's fear-mongering though. I mean, look, I think of some of the, the lone wolf terrorists, you know, so to speak, as, as being more similar to school shooters than I do to Osama bin Laden. Be, because Islam is attached to it, I think it's like the boogeyman. Um, but you know why? Why aren't we in this state of panic in the United States about young white men shooting up movie theaters and, and, and schools? No one, no one in the U.S. is talking about that in the context of terrorism. But because someone who wants to kill another person happens to claim that they're doing it in the name of Islam, it's 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 pure power of nightmares. This is like Osama bin Laden 101. It's how you scare the West. And you know, I, I just think we're overreacting, and it, it's it's we're going to pay for it. I, I just I, I think we're being really stupid in how we're approaching this. So if you're so smart, why are they so dumb? Like why? <laughs> I, I, don't th I don't think I'm so smart. I, I, and I don't necessarily think that they're dumb. But if, they, if you're right, why, why aren't they seeing it? Well, I mean, when was the last time that President Obama was on the ground in Yemen or Somalia? Um, I think there's a whole uh, you know, sort of think tank industry in the United States dedicated to the idea that radical Islam is this unique threat above all others. And I think there's a racism to it. Um, so it's not, it's not that I'm smart and they're dumb or, or vice versa. I think it's, uh, it's, it's that we're looking at the same data and coming to very different conclusions. So will this change? Do you, do you have any hope? <laughs> no, because look, in the United States, I, I, I think that politicians should have to wear, uh, you know, like NASCAR type outfits with their corporate sponsors, you know, on their logos. And every Congress member should have to go to Congress wearing all of their sponsors' logos. And it would be the, the number one logo that you would see would just be the war industry. Um, so, you, you know, you asked me, will any of this change? Unless, unless we get huge corporate money out of our political process in the United States, nothing will fundamentally change. Uh, every four years, we have the most expensive election in history, billions of dollars being poured into this stuff. The war industry knows, you know, which way the wind is blowing. Uh, you know, for someone like Barack Obama, who, you know, is an incredibly brilliant man um, and is, you know, really captured the imagination, I think, not only of Americans, but of the world when he ran his campaign, you know, he had no military experience, limited foreign policy experience. He gets briefed by the CIA after getting the nomination for the Democratic Party, and they bombard him with every possible attack that could happen against the United States. They, over, they do this to every president. The permanent security apparatus in the United States just overwhelms them. And they say, if you discontinue this program, we could get hit on the American homeland. If you don't expand our ability to hit in Yemen, we could get hit on the American homeland. It would take an extraordinary person to say, I hear you, generals, admirals, CIA, NSA. I, I understand all of this. And I know you guys have been doing this for, for a long time. But um, I'm actually going to hit the pause button on all of this. You know, what, what happens when there is an attack then? He's done. He's finished. You know, will things change? No, not unless we, A, get rid of corporate uh, involvement with our elections, and B, uh, impose some level of oversight or investigation 
into the real powers in our country, which is the, the back end people at our intelligence agencies and in our law enforcement agencies. Jeremy, it's been a real pleasure to talk Thank to you. you. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you.